from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. We've for you today highlights from a special informational webinar conducted by K-State yesterday on growing industrial hemp for research purposes here in Kansas. From the Kansas Department of Agriculture, Dana Ladner goes over the stringent legal requirements that researchers and producers must meet to produce industrial hemp in the state, including obtaining a license for doing so. Then K-State's Jason Griffin will go over the agronomic traits of industrial hemp and what research and experiences in other states have shown about what it takes to achieve good yields, either for fiber or for grain. Later on today on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Ward Upham talks garden tomato variety selection with us. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Well, it's a new agricultural interest that seems to be getting quite some traction of late. Ever since the state of Kansas, through the legislature last year, signed off on the opportunity for interested parties, including producers, to grow industrial hemp strictly for research purposes. And this has prompted a storm of questions about the practicality of growing the crop in the state as well as the potential end markets for it. Yesterday, K-State Research and Extension hosted a webinar which covered in some detail many of these important particulars concerning industrial hemp production. And on today's broadcast, we're going to share with you highlights from that webinar featuring the two presenters. One looked at the regulatory process associated with researching industrial hemp in the state and the other at the agronomic traits of this crop. Of course, the oversight on it falls to the Kansas Department of Agriculture. The department's compliance education and outreach coordinator, Dana Ladner, passed along several important things to know about the process as per the new law that was passed in 2018. I've been on the road since uh, October 22nd talking about industrial hemp, and I've talked to over 1,300 people at meetings across the state and then some of those that we've held in Manhattan. Uh, What's in the law? I think this is really important uh, to grow in Kansas and growing season 2019. You must use certified seed. So that's one of the key things with it. And it is a research pilot program. So there is a two page research proposal that is due if you're a grower, a distributor, or a processor. It's not PhD level research, but we understand it's farmer research, and other entities. Um, In addition to the certified seed requirement, anyone seeking a license, primary and secondary folks on a license, have to be fingerprinted and submitted to state and national criminal background checks. So that's really important with it, and that does mean everybody. I know there are a lot of farm families that may be interested. Um, Lots of questions on research. What does research look like? what they may want to research, whether it's water use, soil use, economic analysis, um, those that might want to be a distributor in the trucking business, you know, how does that pencil out? Will they make money being able to haul from a grower to a processor? So there are lots of options for research. And again, it's not meant to be PhD level, but this is brand new to Kansas. And so we really want to learn as much as we can about growing industrial hemp in our state so we can continue in the future years. And anyone that's interested in obtaining one of these research licenses for industrial hemp production for research purposes for this year must do so no later than March the 1st, that is, a week from tomorrow. Um, As folks are submitting their applications, it is all individuals that will be participating. Folks really need to plan ahead on who's going to be involved with their operation. Maps are 
required with that with GPS coordinates. So as an agency, we know where those fields are or storage buildings or processing facilities. So that way, uh, when it comes time for an inspection, we can easily find those fields. Again, background check and fees. And then our advisory board blindly reviews all of the applications. They have a unique numbered identifier with them. They'll read the proposals. There's a score sheet of zero to three that they will give their uh, ranking on and then discuss them as a whole. They will either conditionally approve or deny, and then Secretary Beam will sign off on those. Now, if one is successful in securing that production license, here's what happens next. Once someone has received notification, an email is the primary mode of uh, communication, so it's a lot quicker than USPS with it. If they have been conditionally approved, they have 15 days to submit their license fee check, and then they will be issued their license number. And everybody who has a unique number with that and is for each research area. Law enforcement will have copies of where all of the facilities are, so they know there's been a lot of questions in the state about law enforcement. They will be notified of where those facilities or fields are. And as you might imagine, with something as tightly regulated as this, a certain amount of paperwork will have to be maintained and turned in along the way. There are a lot of reports that will be due along the way. and The agency needs to be notified prior to harvest when they think they're going to be able to harvest. So we can come out and take those samples and get them uh, through our lab and notify that that sample is below that 3.3 3 THC. And industrial hemp is fickle. And Jason will be able to share what he's learned about that. And so having producers notify the agency pre-harvest so we can get those samples taken so they can get in the field is imperative. And then there's also post-harvest analysis, then harvest certificate that will be issued. And those need to stay with that product all the way through the process. So having a license on person for each of their research areas and keeping harvest certificates with the product are really important. Dana added that before one embarks on this process, they need to have an absolute firm handle on what the end use of that industrial hemp would be, should they be granted that license to grow it. The intended end use, that's really important for growers to know because there are different varieties of seed um, that are for the fiber, the seed, or the oil. And so making sure that end processor and in use is known ahead of time, it's really important to make sure that the seed put in the ground is what the processor wants. And there are still more primary regulations, Dana told the webinar audience. Among those would be the scale of production allowed an individual upon obtaining the license. License areas, those are required in a map. Um, The biggest thing is for 2019, growers can have 80 acres within a section. And that would be their the research section. Again, that mile square, they can have 80 acres within that. They can have a continuous 80 acres. They can have it uh, broken up into different fields with it. But we need that mapped out so we can find them when it comes time for inspection. The research proposal. There will be seven questions, and they will be scored zero to three. And keep it simple. Two pages is the max. So if you or those you're working with can write, you know, a great answer in three, four, five sentences within each question, that's great. You know, the research question, what do they want to learn? And everybody, whether you're a grower, distributor, or a processor, has to fill out the research proposal because we all have something to learn. Uh, Section B on experimental design It can be easier. Are they going to hand plant? Are they going to use a planter? If they're a distributor, you know, how many trucks are they going to use? Different size trucks, et cetera. Data. Data is important. We need to learn for the state of Kansas what's going to work for for us for the future, how it's going to be implemented. Again, um, acres, square feet, research, you know, where are we at with that? 
And how are you going to collect, record, and analyze? If folks want to keep it in a notebook and that's how they're used to it, then that's great. If they want to put it in an Excel spreadsheet, that's great. Things that as a grower they may look at are growing degree days, rainfall events, uh, temperature with it. We, we don't know how it'll grow across the state. And well, we have a lot of difference in rainfall events, wind speeds, weather, you know, is huge for the state of Kansas. And then we'd like some type of thought on um, how they're going to draw some conclusions. So on the regulatory side, there's a ton of things to account for. And in a moment, we'll give you the website to go to to investigate all of this further. But as a broad observation, Dana urged interested parties to do their homework and uh, be vigilant about what they might be getting into. What the agency is putting out when people ask us for advice. The biggest thing is to one, if they're growers, to follow sound agronomic practices And two, whether it's a grower, distributor, or a processor, follow sound business practices because there are a lot of new business relationships that are being formed by folks that you may not have been doing business with before. And so make sure everything is in writing. Make sure lawyers look at things. If folks are just being approached right now, that's not enough time really to think through the whole process. So Sound agronomic and sound business practices are essential to make this go throughout the state. And then as far as participating in the program, having open lines of communication with the Department of Agriculture is the second thing that's most important. That's Dana Ladner, Compliance Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Kansas Department of Agriculture. The ultimate source for information on industrial hemp research production in the state of Kansas is the department's website, agriculture.ks.gov. You'll find the link prominent right there at the top of that page, agriculture.ks.gov. More on the agronomic side of growing industrial hemp in Kansas from that webinar that took place yesterday. After this break, you're listening to Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. We're back now on Agriculture Today with additional information for you presented during a special webinar that K-State hosted yesterday on industrial hemp production in the state, currently allowed for research purposes only. You heard earlier about the regulatory side of this enterprise as it stands currently in Kansas. The other segment of this webinar got into the agronomics. K-State's Jason Griffin offered up some knowledge on that aspect. He is the director of the John C. Pear Horticulture Center at Hayesville, just outside of Wichita, and that will be one of the sites where the university plans to conduct industrial hemp field trials, along with two other sites potentially in Kansas, Olathe and Colby. Jason opened up his part of the webinar, letting folks know more about the nature of this plant itself. Uh, It is a wind-pollinated summer annual, which is important for several reasons. Um, Generally, for certified seed, you've got to have a radius of of three miles without any pollen contamination. Uh, That is important for anybody who wants to grow seed. It's not so important for anybody interested in growing fiber or grain. Uh, Pollen doesn't really matter, but if you're interested in growing CBD, obviously, uh, you need to be three miles away from any fiber or grain varieties or any feral hemp pollinated female flowers do not produce as high quality CBD. So uh, that's why that's important. Root system, you've heard people make crazy claims about hemp and it's incredible drought tolerance. It doesn't need any water. Um, We probably will have to water it a little bit to produce good quality hemp, but it does have a pretty impressive root system and good soil up to to eight feet. 
probably won't be eight feet in, in much of our clay soils, but, uh, but it does have a pretty extensive root system. Strongly photoperiod sensitive, uh, which is also important. Plant likes warm growing conditions. Generally plant in May-ish, May or early June. Plant is just as happy as can be. And then as days start to shorten, it begins to flower and senesce thereafter. Uh, that's important depending on where you are in the country. I think we'll be just fine here in Kansas. Again, in chatting with colleagues around the country, the varieties are highly variable. Uh, a variety which does very well for colleagues at Cornell does not produce well in Kentucky. For example, the variety um, Felina 32 has been grown successfully in upstate New York for years without any issues. Uh, grown in Ohio, it went hot and they had to destroy the crop. So I'm really interested. We're going to do some variety trials looking at how these varieties are going to perform in Kansas. It's a it's an important issue for us. Now, a great deal of this current allure of industrial hemp has to do with one of the end uses that appears to have great marketability, and that is for medicinal purposes. Uh, CBD is obviously the, the, the big hot commodity right now. We're going to try growing some high CBD varieties, looking at horticultural versus agronomic productions. Um, we have heard rumors that the higher CBD varieties can be unreliable. For example, cherry wine is a variety that produces up to a little over um, 10% CBD, which is which is quite high. Um, it is a variety that is a result of a hybrid between the wife and Charlotte's cherries. And the wife and Charlotte's cherries both produce THC upwards of 1%. Cherry wine typically does not. But again, it is. it has been um, in tests and other states has been uh, quite variable and frequently does go above the 0.3. So I would, it scares me that the thought of some farmers investing tens of thousands of dollars in plugs of, of cherry wine just to have to destroy their crop. And Jason mentioned the distinction between horticulture and agronomic production of industrial hemp. And he says that's a significant consideration when thinking about the practicality of raising this crop. We mean by horticulture versus agronomic production, um, there's there's debate on which which method produces, uh, you get the, the best return on your investment, whether it's this sort of plastic culture, tomato type production, um, which is you know, drip irrigation and the plants are, the flower buds are pruned off by hand and harvested and dried versus more of a large field of a hemp variety, which produces lower CBD, but has much less cost in labor. You just go through there with the combine and collect the chaff that comes out and uh, you press that, and that's where you get your where you get your CBD from. So there, there's debate, and the economists have to figure out which one of these methods uh, is most economical. That said, there are known principles for growing this crop, either for fiber or for grain. Jason passed along what experiences and research elsewhere tell us. So if you're growing for fiber, uh, the goal is obviously strong vegetative growth, and the variety selection is going to be important, as is planting date. If you plant really early, your plants get taller. If you plant really late, your plants don't get nearly as tall and they flower and senesce before you get the length out of the stem that, that you're looking for. And also different varieties produce different quantities of fiber in their stems. So the variety is going to be very important. Obviously, uh, the well-aerated, fertile, organic soil is best. Um, you could say that for almost any plant in the world. Uh, the weed-free seed bed is important as well. If you're trying to grow for CBD in particular, and you have a highly infested weed field, uh, your quality of your CBD and the quality of your plants are going to go down. Um, but if you're growing for fiber, generally with a higher planting density, that it outcompetes the weeds. Drill three quarters to an inch deep. Rates vary widely uh, in, in the literature, 40 to 65 pounds. Kentucky uses 60 pounds per acre. Uh, again, close spacing for, for weed control. Inadequate moisture for the first six weeks. Colleagues around the country speak of uh, this sort of lack of seedling vigor. They describe hemp as coming out of the ground, getting six to eight inches tall, and then just sitting there for three weeks and just sitting there and sitting there before it starts to grow. Obviously, probably putting on root growth, waiting for, uh, waiting for the top to grow. And in that time is when the weeds, weed pressure starts to build up. So seedling vigor could, could be an issue. Fertilization is generally 50 pounds of N per acre at planting, and that's it for fiber. Um, too much nitrogen equals poor fiber quality. It's a nice, not, it's not a high fertilizer requirement for 
for fiber. Warm growing conditions, generally four months for fiber, a little bit longer um, if you're gonna be harvesting for, for seed. Harvest at the onset of reproductive growth. So when you start, when the males start to shed pollen, that's roughly when, when you go through and harvest. Uh, there's lots of different ways to harvest. Research is still uh, being conducted on, on the retting process. Uh, best ways to do that, whether you ret in the field, which most people do, and that's a breaking down of the stem tissue to separate the, the fibers, can be done in the field or it can be done, some people actually tank ret in, in, in water, which is obviously a little more labor intensive and, and expensive. Uh, and the field is generally the most common, takes a couple of weeks. Crop has to be rotated, otherwise the, the stem is on top, rets and the ones down below don't. Um, and there's obviously moisture requirements for, for belling and storage. So then what differs when raising industrial hemp for grain? Uh, if you're growing for grain, it's becoming increasingly popular. The hemp seed oil, um, the seeds themselves for uh, human consumption or for animal feed. If you're growing for grain, obviously you want a higher ratio of females with more branching and more flowers, so you get more seed. Generally, a shorter stature plant. Uh, again, the selection, variety selection is going to be very important for us. Um, do we get those in the field and test them and see which ones perform well for us? Uh, the general recommendations for fertilizer are kind of like corn a little fertilizer at planting and then a side dressing uh, a little bit later on in the season. Everybody says if you can. You can grow good corn, you can grow good hemp. This seems to be the, the slogan people are using. The flowers will shatter, uh, so harvest is important. Generally, the recommendation is harvest when about 75% of the seed has matured, so roughly 25% of your seed are gonna be immature. Uh, but if you wait until the seeds at the top of the inflorescence are mature, then you've lost most of the seeds at the bottom inflorescence. They'll be sitting on the field because uh, they, they do shatter. Can be harvested with a, with a combine. Uh, if you just YouTube industrial hemp harvesting, you should see the amazing equipment that is being designed in other countries to, to harvest hemp. It's, it is insane what, these, what this equipment will do. Obviously, high fiber plant causes combine issues. Uh, I won't say that combine fires are common, but they're not uncommon either. Uh, fibers wind around moving parts. The Bearings heat up, grease leaks out, and next thing you know, you've got a, a combine fire. So there is there is issues. Most people who are harvesting hemp with a combine have made modifications to it to prevent this uh, fiber from, from binding up around moving parts. That a quick introductory on the agronomics of raising industrial hemp. Jason concluded by echoing the sentiments of the Kansas Department of Agriculture's Dana Ladner earlier about producers proceeding with caution when considering this alternative crop. Um, I am advising people to go into industrial hemp production with their eyes wide open. If anybody, just tell them right up front, if anybody is promising you that you're going to get rich, walk away. If anybody is promising you a pot of gold, I wouldn't trust that person. Anybody you do business with is going to present you with a contract. You should definitely take that contract to your lawyer before you sign any of those contracts. So eyes wide open is the message that I'm, that I'm telling everybody. That from K-State's Jason Griffin, the director of the John C. Pear Horticulture Center near Wichita, and one of those directly involved in K-State's upcoming industrial hemp research projects. If you've more questions, you can channel those to the Kansas Department of Agriculture directly. We'll be back with more in a few moments here on Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. And glancing now at today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
The USDA expects American farmers to plant only 85 million acres of soybeans here in 2019, down almost 5 percent thanks to falling commodity prices and the ballooning stocks. And amid the trade war with China, corn acres projected to take over most of those lost bean acres, rising 3 percent to 92 million acres this spring. This all from the USDA's Agricultural Outlook Forum this morning. The USDA's chief economist, Robert Johansson, unveiled those initial projections. He presented a fairly gloomy outlook for grain producers with net farm income dropping to $66 billion in 2018, down 28 percent from the 10-year average. While producers' debt-to-asset ratio remains fairly stable at 13.5 percent, debt financing has risen sharply in the last few years, reaching 25 percent of net farm income in 18, says Johansson. Now, specifically, soybean prices dropped 20 percent after the retaliatory tariffs essentially blocked sales to China last year. In total, U.S. exports to China dropping more than 90 percent last year. Overall, U.S. agricultural exports, according to the Outlook Forum, expected to drop 1.9 billion down to 141 and a half billion this year, with Chinese exports down an additional 6 percent. As a result, China will fall to fifth in the U.S. marketplace this year after being the number one market back in 2017. Soybean prices are not expected to recover quickly from this situation, with carryout stocks expected to grow 472 million to a record 910 million bushels this marketing year. He said the record high stocks in the U.S. due to the trade situation will take several years to unwind, which will weigh on U.S. prices going forward, even with potential China purchase agreements. And Johansson estimated that soybean prices will actually edge up by about 2 percent to an average price of $8.80 per bushel, uh, showing that prices for beans will take at least until the 2020 year to recover. Corn prices also expected to creep up 1.4 percent to 3.65 a bushel. And at 92 million acres, corn planting will near its record of 94 million acres in 2016 when the price ratio for production also favored corn. Wheat acres, according to the Outlook Forum, not projected to pick up as many lost soybean acres as expected, according to Johansson. Winter wheat acreage expected to be the lowest since 1909, with fall seedings dropping by 500,000 acres here in Kansas, 200,000 in Oklahoma, 170,000 in Nebraska. Last year, wheat prices on average expected to rise 1% to 520 per bushel this year. With such little growth in commodity prices, the USD DA is keeping a close eye on farm bankruptcies, which have risen in key agricultural states such as Kansas, Nebraska, Wisconsin, and Minnesota as of last year. Nationally, the rate remains fairly low at 2.3 bankruptcies per 10,000 farms, according to Johansson. Farmer real estate debt reaching a record high of more than $250 billion last year. However, that debt-to-asset ratio remains under 15 percent, as opposed to the 20 percent levels reached in the mid 1980s. And livestock and dairy markets also reeling from the trade war, according to the Outlook Forum report. After retaliatory tariffs on U.S. dairy and pork in 2018, hog prices dropped 20 percent. Johansson did not comment on the likelihood of those tariffs being removed and only stated that if they are, dairy and hog prices would likely recover yet this year. Hog prices are forecast to drop 7.5 percent to 42.50 per hundred weight. That would be a five-year low. Broiler price also expected to drop almost 1% to $97 per hundred weight as production expands modestly there in 2019. And Fed steer prices, according to the outlook, expected to rise slightly to $118.50 per hundred weight, supported by good demand. Milk prices expected to see a modest recovery this year, with prices rising 6.5% up to $17.25 per hundred weight. However, because growers will also run into slightly higher feed prices, prices, dairy producers should expect only slightly higher profit margins this year. All of that according to the USDA's Agricultural Outlook Forum report, which was issued this morning by the department. Next for you, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update, and standing by with that is Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Polly Rulin, the CEO of the United Soybean Board, is joining us. And Polly, as we look into the present, we have to look towards the future as well. And specifically for boards like the United Soybean Board and associated with that, the Soybean Checkoff as well. How do you feel that future is looking right now? I think the future has never been brighter for boards like the United Soybean Board and its affiliated state partners. And the reason is, when you have times that are very tough times, like soybean farmers are going through right now, when prices are low, when supply is high, when sometimes we have bean quality, harvest has been rough, we've got the tariffs, you know, on and on, we have challenges. The reason that the Soybean Checkoff exists is to look forward and see the demand side of the chain and make sure that demand for soybeans is very, very strong. And as long as you have strong demand for soybeans, then you can accommodate little bumps in the road on the supply side. So the Soybean Checkoff and United Soybean Board have been busy looking for other international markets um, so that we can diversify our portfolio of markets. For example, adding India through poultry is a great example. So how can we sell more soybeans, be that in the form of food, feed, fuel, or fiber. A lot of that focus is on those countries that have the low quantity of soybeans or low input of what they eat or what they use as far as soybeans are concerned. And especially when you think about the opportunities for meat protein in the future around the world and how important soybeans are for poultry, for example, and for pork. When a country starts to gain disposable income, those citizens want a higher quality protein in their diet, and that means they're going to be eating more meat. And they start usually with fish, they move to chicken, and then they move to pork. So anytime we can grow meat consumption in a country and we can feed U.S. soy to domestic animals in order to fulfill that need with U.S. meat, that means soybean farmers are better off. So those partnerships with our supply chain, with our customers in pork and poultry are extremely important and become even more important as we continue to grow yields and supply. You sound optimistic. Those numbers are out there. That potential is out there to really grow that industry. Uh, Listen, I come from the meat industry, so I know what the outlook for meat consumption is globally for the next little while, and it is extremely extremely good. A good outlook for meat consumption means a good outlook for soybeans production and demand in this country. That is Polly Ruland, who serves as CEO of the United Soybean Board, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Thanks, Greg. And we will return with more shortly on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. For you now on Agriculture Today, our weekly horticulture segment, and winter is still upon us, as is ringingly clear, unfortunately, in Kansas. So maybe to get us out of the winter doldrums, we'll throw some ideas your way about tomato gardening. Planning might be in order for that right now, as we're told by our guest, horticulturist Ward Upham of K-State Research and Extension. Ward, eventually here we're going to share a list of those top tomato varieties that have tested out well in a couple of categories here in Kansas. But why are we talking tomatoes now? There is actually a reason for doing this. There actually is. So some of the varieties that we're going to mention you'll probably be able to find as transplants already grown. However, some of them you likely will not. And if you want them, you would have to grow them from seed. And so normally for tomatoes, it takes maybe six weeks from the time you see the tomato until it's big enough to transplant out in the garden. So around the Manhattan area, you're usually talking about May 10th as a safe date to put outside. You have to back up six weeks from there to actually see the tomato inside. So you have a transplant that's large enough to go in the garden. Now, there are categories or types of tomatoes, and this will go a long way to deciding what is suitable for your gardening needs. Yeah, you can categorize tomatoes as indeterminate, semi-determinate, and determinate. Now, determinate tomatoes are usually used primarily by commercial growers. 
they are designed so that they'll produce one large crop and then very little for the rest of the year. Now, that works well for commercial growers because they plant a certain set of tomatoes. And when they harvest them, they're done with them. And they get tomatoes through the season by planting tomatoes like every two weeks. And so they get tomatoes, but they don't have to go back and harvest the same plants time after time after time. It's an efficiency matter. It is. That's what they're after. And sometimes homeowners will grow some of these if they're going to make like tomato juice or tomato sauce or something like that, where they want a lot of tomatoes at once. But if they do that, they also grow the other types. So on the other range of the scale is is indeterminate tomatoes. Now, these are going to get much, much larger, but they're going to produce tomatoes through the season. And so even if they're staked or if they're caged, they'll probably get six feet tall pretty easily. And so much larger, much more wild plant, but you get tomatoes through the season. In between those is what we call semi-determinate. Now, these will produce more tomatoes in a group, but then they continue to produce throughout the season. They're going to be smaller. They're going to be able to be planted closer together if you wish to do that. And so you can get more, actually, tomatoes per area with a semi determinant than an indeterminate just because you can space them closer. And if one has adequate space, there's nothing wrong with growing, uh, well, at least you say the semi-determinate or the indeterminate tomatoes side right. by side. That's right. And I actually grow all three. So I grow uh, indeterminate, semi-determinate, and determinate. And so an example of determinate is Primo Red. Uh, it's about the only one I grow, but it has very large fruit early and a lot of fruit all at one time. But uh, a lot of people, what they really like are the indeterminate ones, even though they're larger plants, but you do get fruit throughout the season. And share with us some information about the tomato trials that K-State has been holding. The new information that you have to share on not only the yield, but the size of fruit and those that rise to the top in each category. Yeah, let's look at yield first. And so this is the number of tomatoes or the weight of tomatoes per plant. Mm -hmm. And so top of the list, which is kind of surprising, is again Jet Star. Jet Star is an old, old variety and it's competing against a lot of newer varieties. And yet it is still, at least in this study, at the top of the list. Yeah, for yield, that is. That is for yield. And so large yields on these tomatoes. In this case, they got a little over 20 pounds per plant through the season. There are some tomatoes that in other years have done better, but this is the one we use as a, as a check when we're comparing newer tomatoes. Jetstar is the one that we have that we compare against. So it is probably at the top of the list. Um, there are a number of beef steaks that also have done fairly well, and so it's just a matter of, of what you want in order to get good yield per plant. So fruit size. The ones that did best in our study was Brandywine Red. Now, notice there are other types of Brandywine. There's Brandywine Yellow. There's Brandywine Black. It's the Brandywine Red that has the very large fruit size. In our case, it averaged 16 ounces per fruit. That's a pound per fruit. Hmm. And that's average. That's not what the largest fruit on the plant was. That was average. The problem with Brandywine Red is we only had three fruit per plant. It just didn't yield. But the next one down, which was 15.5 ounces per fruit instead of 16, only a half ounce lighter, was Hawaiian pineapple. And it produced 19 fruit per plant instead of three. So if, what a difference. <laughs> there is a big difference there. So if I, if I wanted an absolutely huge fruit, what I would get would be Hawaiian pineapple, just because it is productive as well as having that huge fruit. Now, if you look at these two lists that we have, we list the top 10 in each. If you look at those two lists. The one that did the best in both categories or kind of the average of the best in both categories would be Master Hybrid. It produced about 9 ounces per fruit and 53 fruit per vine. Really high production, very good fruit size. And so it would be one that I'm going to try this year. You know, this is one study. There are only two plants in the study for each variety. And so take that with a grain of salt. But it kind of points you in the direction of what maybe you should try and see what works for you. And where Ward might one access these lists? So the easiest way to find this information, it's in our horticulture newsletter. Do a search on Kansas State University Horticulture Information Center. Kansas State University Horticulture Information Center. Then click on the newsletter. There will be a link to that. And this is the February 5th issue. 
So it's right there and handy. Be a good review as you think about your tomato variety selection for the upcoming season. As Ward says, a number of these varieties will need to be started from seed. And if that is the case, you'll be growing your own transplants, and those will need to go into those flats pretty soon now, uh, despite the weather that we have outside currently. Ward, we appreciate the brief respite from winter with these comments. Thank you. You bet. That from Ward Upham, horticulturist, K-State Research and Extension. And as he says, once more, you can access this information and much more on topical horticultural matters at the Horticultural Information Center out of K-State. Simply search for, by those words, K-State Horticulture Information Center. That wraps up our horticulture segment for this week and our time for this Thursday edition. We'll be right back here tomorrow and hope you will rejoin us then. Meantime, Eric Atkinson here bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.